Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call to order the Special Education Subcommittee of the Quincy School Committee. Um, first up on our agenda is a new individual education plan format uh, presented by Ms. Graham and Ms. Leary. Thank you so much. Am I on? Yes? Okay. I think so. Thank you, Mrs. Perdios and committee. Thank you for having us this evening. Um, as we have mentioned numerous times over the last couple of months, um, the Department of Education has um, been rolling out a new IEP form. Um, that we have been uh, slowly getting ourselves acclimated with and wanted to share it with you this evening um, as we have been uh, working with our school-based staff to get them um, up and ready in uh, getting more adjusted to it and really giving them time to practice and play with it um, so that when it is implementation for school year 24-25 that we will be as ready as we possibly can be. Um, so with, e with me this evening is Jennifer Leary and Simone Buckley. Um, and I uh, just want to start with this little graphic that was shared with us, um, that what do these things have in common? Um, so the first Nokia cell phone, um, the Massachusetts IEP form, and the Da Vinci Code. Um, <laughs> all of these things uh, were first um, sent out in 2003. Um, since then, uh, Nokia has uh, introduced many, many other cell phones. Uh, Dan Brown has gone on to write many other novels that have been on many bestseller lists. Um, Back in 2003, Simone Buckley was still a Quincy Public School student, um, and the IEP form has not changed since then. Um, so the Department of Ed, probably about four or five years ago, um, started taking some information from stakeholders and really put together a strong working group um, to kind of pull apart the old IEP form and really look at ways that they can improve that for students and families. So the IEP improvement project had very specific goals. Uh, the goals of the projects were to improve outcomes for all students with disabilities by providing guidance, technical assistance, and tools on equitable processes. Again, they really wanted to stress that this had equal access to everyone involved, to schools and district professionals, family and students, so that all students with disabilities had meaningful access to the curriculum and to the life of the school. They looked at these five really important areas. The first one was the family and student voice. This is evident by the changes on the very first page of the IEP, which I will go to next. Um, also looking at the forms process, um, they really wanted to make sure that the form was universally understood by all. Um, as you may recall when we presented on the uh, procedural safeguards, it's really important that families and students are equitable partners in creating students' IEPs. And there was a lot of jargon in previous IEPs, and we really wanted to make sure that that language, I should say they, the Department of Ed, wanted to make sure that language was understood by everyone involved. Um, it's also much more clear to read. As you'll see, the format is in much more a sequential order, um, and things are much more easily located through the form itself. Um, the next section that they were very mindful of is always ensuring that students are accessing curriculum in the least restrictive environment. Um, the integration of the transitional planning form, which is for, our, is for our students that are 14 or older or turning 14 in the IEP period. Previously, that form was at the very end of the IEP, and now it is right in the heart of the IEP so that it is driving a lot of that development. And then finally, it was accessibility of language. Now there is a section that speaks about um, do families need translation services? Is the student an EL student that also does require special education service? So really making sure that those needs are addressed in the IEP as well. So the first section that we're going to look at is the parent concerns and student vision. So the key difference to note on this, so this is still the very first page of the IEP. There's the administrative data sheet and then there's this page. The big difference now is that the majority of that page used to be taken up by the student strengths and key evaluation results. That is no longer on that very first page. This first page is really and truly dedicated to student and family voice. So the first section um, is the same question that it was before, is what are your concerns and what do you want addressed in this IEP? The second section, which I know um, you had a number of questions for us, is how are we going to do about doing this, but is really looking at the student and team vision. Again, that was lumped together before. It was a, a statement at the end. 
Um, but this adds um, some guiding questions and really allows for that student voice to be heard while also including other members of the team. So for our youngest learners, um, you know, we'll ask in this school year, what do you want to learn? Um, you know, we will be working with our teams to potentially do that through some, some picture cues or maybe some simple social stories just so that the students are involved. It will certainly not be done during the IEP meeting, but potentially, you know, with a classroom teacher or maybe a guidance counselor, the speech therapist, um, so that that student voice is heard. Maybe we ask them, what's your favorite subject at school? What do you like most about school? Um, and then by the time you leave elementary or middle school, you know, what do you want to accomplish? What are your goals for yourself? Some students may say, I really love science and I want to make sure that I'm taking science classes every, we just don't know and we really want to make sure that we're including their voice. Um, the next section is for when students are turning 14 in the IEP period. Um, so it's for students that are 14 to 22. Um, and again, you know, we will be asking these questions in whatever mode of communication is um, best for our students, whether it's using picture cues or it's using an AEC device, um, simple sentence structures. And we'll ask them, you know, questions about what's your favorite part of school? What's your favorite subject? Is there something that you like to do in the future? What do you want to do to have fun? Um, where do you see yourself maybe working? Um, where might you want to live and who would you like to support you? So these are all questions that will be asked of the student. And then the parent and the uh, additional members of the team will have input at the end um, in response to what the student has said, um, what do you want for your student's vision this year? And in response to what the student has said, what do you see um, in the next five years? The next section is the disability category, English language learners and assistive technology. So on the previous IEP, the student's primary disability was listed at the end of those key evaluation results. And when I say, it was listed, it wasn't a checkbox. And so we always had to make sure it was written in. And there are times that people just forgot. Sometimes those key evaluation results can go on for two, three, four pages. And that little tiny primary disability is the last sentence of that. So now this is front and center on that next page. What is the student's primary disability? Um, if the student's primary disability is autism and that's checked off, there are additional things that we'll speak about later that are then populated into the IEP that are specifically for the needs resulting in, an, in the primary disability of autism. This section also does include um, if a student is an English language learner. Um, this change is, in, is intended to help us support students who are potentially duly identified as needing supports in both EL and special education. And this section also does now include a section for assistive technology. Oops, sorry about that. Um, it will indicate whether or not a student requires assistive technology services or devices. And if yes is indicated, we then have to answer, is it in the uh, accommodations and modifications? Is it in the goals and objectives, the service delivery, or the additional information? I'm now going to turn it over to Jennifer to talk about the present levels of performance. Um, so this section has quite a significant change from the old IEP, so I'm going to take up quite a bit of time to talk about this part. In the current IEP, there are two um, present levels of performance pages that are just referred to as PLEP A and PLEP B, and the A and B are kind of meaningless. It's just the page one and page two. Um, each of those pages has similar questions. The first, PLEP A, focuses on general cu curriculum areas, and PLEP B focused on other educational needs. So really broad categories there. And it talked about a lot of different information, including the areas that were affected by the disability, how the disability impacts progress, all of the accommodations were listed on these pages in the old form, and then any specially designed instruction were also on this page. The new form now has four present level pages. So we're gonna take a look at each of those pages individually and what those focus areas are. The first one is the present levels of academic achievement and functional performance in the area of academics. So I've highlighted here on each of these pages what area it's focusing on so we can see it. Um, this, is designed, this page is designed to give a clear picture of how the disability impacts a student's academic areas in school. The layout is different than the old form. Accommodations and modifications are no longer included on this page. They have the whole separate section later that Ms. Buckley will discuss. There are three boxes here that are common to all four of the present level pages. 
The first box discusses the student's current performance. The second, their strengths, interest areas, and preferences. And the third, the impact of the disability on involvement and progress in the general education curriculum. Data must be included in all three of these boxes. So this is now where any key evaluation results that previously were on the first page of the old IEP will now be included. We, can, uh, we will include information and data results from initial evaluations and three-year reevaluations in all three of these boxes, and also include any other assessment data, such as screenings and progress monitoring that happens throughout the school year. Um, as Ms. Graham mentioned earlier, when a student is diagnosed with autism as their primary disability, um, the IEP is going to automatically populate the autism-specific questions. We also, we've always needed to address these seven questions throughout the IEP. On the previous form, they were listed on the very last page. And so here, the seven questions are divided out into the different areas that they're relevant to, so that you're talking about each question while you're talking about that area instead of in a separate section. So in this page, um, the, the autism-specific question is if any needs are identified, you check there in the IEP where those needs will be addressed. Um, again, through those options of accommodations and modifications, goals and objectives, the service delivery grid, or additional information. This particular question is about any impact of autism on the general curriculum. The second present level page focuses on behavioral, behavioral, social, and emotional needs of a student. So this was not a separate page before. So now we have an entire section focused on behavior and social <coughs> emotional needs. Again, the layout has those same three boxes addressing current performance, strengths, and the impact of the disability where all data in the, this area will be included. The major change here is the location of the bullying statement. The bullying statement used to be at the end of the previous IEP after we had discussed all other areas of the student's needs. Now it's integrated into the social emotional page so that it's a natural part of the conversation. So if we're talking about a student's social emotional and behavioral needs, then we're moving right into is the student a bully or a victim of bullying, and how are we going to address that at school? Um, and again, there's a location to check how their behavior and social emotional needs will be addressed later in the IEP. There are five specific autism-specific questions on this page, again, really related to the behavioral and social emotional needs of students with autism, including whether positive behavioral interventions are necessary, developing social interaction skills, um, reactions to any changes in environment or daily routines, which can be really challenging for students on the spectrum, any repetitive activities or movements, and a, stu a student's response to sensory experiences in school. The third present level's performance page spoke, focuses specifically on communication. Again, this did not have a separate page in the old format. Once again, we have the same three boxes for current performance, strengths, and impact in which all the data will be included. Um, and this page now has a new section specifically focusing on augmentative and alternative communication supports, or AAC strategies. So it asks, does the student require augmentative communication? And if yes, there are options there for where they might need it, home, school, other environments, and who on the student's team requires training in order to support those students with those devices. So um, a student who has it for the first time may need some training themselves. Their parents might need training. Teachers might need training. So we need to indicate all of those, um, those people on this page. And again, the options to select where in the IEP we're going to address those needs. The autism specific question for this page is regarding needs in the areas of verbal and nonverbal communication, including any AAC, and how those needs will be addressed. And the fourth area of present levels is additional areas. So this is any other areas that weren't addressed on the previous three pages. Very specifically, they're looking for activities of daily living, health needs, hearing, motor, sensory, and vision. Same three boxes for current performance, strengths, and impact for the data. Um, and then there are very specific questions on this page for students who are deaf of hard of hearing or blind or visually impaired. So there's a deaf and hard of hearing question where you will indicate how the student's language and communication skills will be addressed in the IEP. And then questions for blind or visually impaired students regarding braille, screen readers or other assistive tech, 
and any potential orientation and mobility services that are necessary. And I just wanted to also mention that all four of those pages are meant to be collaborative pages where any team member can contribute relevant information to those pages. So for example, the communication page is not dedicated just for a speech language pathologist to include information. Teachers have a lot of important in input into how students communicate in their classrooms. So any member of the team who has information about those areas can include it in any one of those four pages. Now I'm going to start talking a little bit about the transition planning documentation. Um, so the transition planning documentation and process has shifted with this new IEP format. Like Julie said earlier, the student's vision is at the front of the IEP, and that's really meant to drive the IEP process and not just the transition planning section. The transition planning form is no longer a separate document that needs to be accessed by teams when a student is between the ages of 14 to 22 or turning 14 during that IEP period. Now it is incorporated into the IEP documentation. This slide demonstrates what the first page of that transition planning documentation will consist of. There will, be, there will still be sections similar to the previous IEP uh, to incorporate students' education and training, employment, and community experiences. Also discussing the strengths in each of those areas as well as the impact of the disability. There is also in addition of the next section that addresses where in the IEP post-secondary transition will be addressed, whether this is through goals, service, delivery, et cetera. You'll also see information regarding students' anticipation graduation date and the type of completion document the student will be receiving. Another addition to this page is the next two questions regarding the planned course of study. This section helps the team focus on what courses of study the student needs to complete in order to receive their form of completion documentation. And finally, where the student currently is in meeting those requirements. On the second page, you'll find community and interagency connections. This is a new section within the transition planning form. The community and interagency connections section is used to capture outside agencies. So students may access services from the Department of Developmental Services, Department of Mental Health, while they're still in school, and this is where we would note that information. The team may also capture any other community connections that the parents share with the team. The team will also now document the notification of transfer of rights in this section. The section was previously a checkbox links with other categories, such as the 688 that I will discuss on the next slide in additional information. The third page is where the team now documents who will be taking over the decision making for the student on their 18th birthday. Previously, we noted this information on the IEP if it was discussed. Now we are more formally documenting the process on the IEP, including um, adding the date of the determination. Similarly, for the 680 referral process, we are now more formally documenting these steps on the student's IEP. We are noting if the student is within two years of exiting special education services, if the team discussed if the student meets the criteria for a 688 referral, and has the referral been submitted along with which agency the referral was made. And again, we are also including the date of submission on the IEP. Now I'm going to discuss a little bit about the accommodations and modifications. As Jen described earlier, this was previously indicated information on the PLEP pages, but now there's an actual page that says accommodations and modifications to help make that a little bit clearer to find that information. So first, when considering accommodations for learning, we continue to emphasize that accommodations do not change what students learn, but rather how they access their learning. The accommodations section is broken down into four parts. IEP teams need to address each part and the four delivery methods. Students with disabilities often face challenges or barriers that inhibit or restrict their ability to access and demonstrate their learning. To eliminate these barriers, we want to consider these four parts. The four parts can be identified as presentation of instruction, which is how the information is presented, response, which is the manner in which the student is asked to respond, such as if they're responding in writing or orally, timing and or scheduling, so what is the timing and scheduling of that instruction, 
setting and or environment. So the characteristics of the setting, such as like noise levels or lighting. And then looking at modifications, when discussing, discussing modifications, these are adaptions that change what students learn and are used with students who require more support or adjustments than accommodations can provide. These are broken down into three categories, content, instruction, and student output. Accommodations and modifications were embedded, like I stated before, in several sections of the previous IEP. And this new page is to allow the team to capture all accommodations and modifications into this one area. The state and district assessments page is similar to the previous version of the IEP. The new format now allows for the team to decide the best way to meet a student's needs when assessing with district or state assessments. Now the team must indicate in the table which assessment requires specific accommodations. For example, if text-to-speech is required in mathematics but not in ELA. Previously, these accommodations were listed out instead of placed in this table format. So again, it helps with that readability. You will also see at the bottom of this page is a question regarding the alternative assessment. This allows a team to successfully document how and why a student will need an alternative assessment for those specific areas. The goals section, so the previous version required a current performance level, the goal and benchmarks or objectives. The new version has taken those three elements and broken them down to allow for more clarity. In order to better explain, the current performance level from the previous version is now the baseline of the student. The baseline information should be taken from the data within the present levels of academic achievement and functional performance that Jen discussed earlier. The measurable annual goal is now separated into three parts, annual goal, criteria, and method with schedule and person responsible for monitoring the progress added. This layout puts an emphasis on the importance of writing SMART goals and utilizing data to determine the mastery of goals. You will also see underneath there is still information regarding the schedule of progress monitoring. The last few parts consist of participation in the general education setting. So in the previous version, this was uh, uh, noted as the non-participation justification section. That section of the IEP has now been updated to the participation in the general education setting. The team will be documenting the least restrictive environment in this section. This is a change in order from the previous version. The least restrictive environment question now comes before the service delivery grid. And the service delivery grid, as you can see, is underneath and is a very similar format to the previous IP. Transportation. Um, so it's important to note, again, that the order of some of these sections have changed. So the order of these two sections in particular have changed in the IEP document. Schedule modifications now comes after transportation schedule. And you'll see as we continue on the next few si slides that there is additional information regarding transportation specifically for extended school year. So looking at the extended school year and additional information starting with the extended school year, um, IEP teams uh, will need to consider the need for extended school year services. And if the student is in need of ESY, this section allows the team to document what services should look like during their ESY programming. This is separate from the service delivery good for the school year. Previously, both school year and ESY services were on the same grid. This new separation helps parents clearly see what services are for ESY versus the school year. On the last section of this page, teams will need to consider and document transportation needs for extended school year program. It's critical that teams consider how a location or schedule change may impact that need for transportation to extended school year programs. And the last page here um, first discusses additional information. So this section is um, located on the IEP to capture any additional relevant information about the student that did not fit into the other sections of the IEP document. If there is no additional information to add, we are encouraging staff to note to not leave this um, section blank and instead state that there is no additional information at this time in order to document that the team addressed the section of the IEP. 
And at the end, you'll see the response section where families indicate if they accept the IEP in full, in part, or reject the IEP in full or in part. Parents also have the opportunity to indicate a request for a meeting due to a full or partial rejection. So that's the new IEP form. Um, uh, how are we preparing to implement this new documentation is um, we have been conducting several training sessions to allow our case managers and service providers to become more familiar with the documentation. Um, we're working really closely with the IT department on um, the document's functionality in Aspen. It, it didn't carry over. Um, you know, we use Aspen. A lot of other school districts use other platforms. So we've been working really closely with Dan Pacho to make sure that um, Aspen looks the way that we want it to look. There's a lot of ways that we customize um, some of the things that we have on there. And so we've been working really closely with Dan to do that. Um, our Quincy staff will transfer new IEPs beginning in September of 2024, and the Department of, N, uh, Department of Ed is mandating a full implementation for the school year of 22, um, 24-25. Um, so we will slowly be rolling it out we, um, so that you know, teams can have some practice um, because we do know this is going to be a lot for them. So um, as family... Uh, Families are starting to see it in potentially some of our out-of-district schools. They're asking about it in district. We're also starting to um, do it in some of our initial evaluations, specifically at the pre-K level, because that is their first IEP. Um, so we have our last set of trainings coming up on March 27th, um, and then we are potentially going to have some staff um, start rolling it out in April if they feel ready. Um, if not, we have other opportunities for additional training after that. Um, we are also uh, doing a similar presentation coming up on the evening of April 4th as a parent academy um, with our CPAC as well. Um, so with that, we thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Great. Thank you so much. Any questions? Mrs. Hubie. Thank you. Um, so with the... Maybe it's just, it might be just the format of going through it without writ anything written in here, but yeah. do you yeah. feel that you're losing any of the personality of the goal of the student in this format as opposed to the older format with their just bringing out what their goals are in here? Or um, We actually feel that it's going to be more focused on the student. Okay. Um, you know, really more. We've always considered the student voice but really having it so clearly delineated on page one with those really specific questions um, and really letting families know from the beginning um, that we want to hear from your student. You know, previously I think the parent vision was kind of large and the student vision may have been small, and now it's the opposite of that. And we just really want to make sure that families understand, especially as students get older, that this IEP is driven by them, and we want to make sure that we're supporting them and meeting their goals. Wonderful. Thank you. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. Thank you. Mrs. Lebo. I just have one question. So they want this fully implemented for the 24-25 school year. Mm -hmm. But if students are not due for a reavail, will you just keep the old one until they are? So we'll do it as in the 24-25 school year as students are coming up for either a review or a reavail. Okay. Um, and so the way that Mr. Pacho has done it for us in Aspen, thank goodness, is that the old information can transfer in, and then we would just have to make adjustments from there. Okay, so um, no so one's going to have to implement this across the board to every student by September? No, it's it's kind of roll out as reviews or reavals are happening next year, right. or initials. And my other question, it's just on the, on the PLEP page, the academic PLEP page, it only showed ELA and history, but that doesn't mean that's all that's really on there. I mean, it, it just, that was the only two things, subjects that it were should have, It has, sorry. Oh, it yeah. may have just been that those were the only things. We copied it from our, like, test student. Yeah. That may have just been the ones okay. that we, yeah. I just, so I figured, it, I figured, any yeah, content area I, that's I affected. They were all available. Yeah. It does say, it has check boxes for English language arts, history and social sciences, math, science, technology, and engineering, and then any other curriculum areas. So you can customize that last one if anything's missing. Thank you. Some of the slides also I started to put together like in 
De November, December. Um, so I took all the screenshots from Aspen back then, and we've been working with Mr. Pacho to update since then. Um, so some of those screenshots in the presentation are probably <laughs> a little bit older. And I like to get fancy with the presentations and added <laughs> like effects. So some of like it might be taken over because the autism question might be covering right. it or something like that. That's what I figured. <laughs> Mr. Bergoli. So this is a 16-page document. It is. And what was the prior document? It really depended on um, the length of the student's strengths and key evaluation results. Some students, those are as small as uh, half a page. Some students, those could run upwards of two, three, four pages. Um, and then again, um, significantly impacted that by the number of goals each student has. Um, some students may just have two or three goals. Some students may have four or five and six goals. So at a minimum, it's 16 pages. Mm -hmm. Yes. And what was a prior? So I have a blank copy, like that has nothing filled out. And so if I have a blank Put copy left. of the IEP, it's yep. eight pages. The transition planning is two pages. But like um, Ms. Graham was saying, the more information that gets inputted, the longer the IEP document is. But a blank one is eight pages for the IEP, not including the admin page, and then two pages for the transition planning form. Okay. So our resource from teachers are responsible for putting this together, correct? With, along with OT, PT, speech, et cetera. As far as inputting the information, correct. yes. Yep. Yeah. How much time do you think they should require to do something like this, as opposed to the prior uh, document? I think once folks get used to it, it will be a similar time because it's, it's all of the same information, it's just placed in different areas. It's probably going to take us a year, if not two, no different than we when we first transferred over to Aspen. Um, take a little bit of time in practice. Did anybody from the state um, include resource room teachers, speech and language people, uh, and get their input? Uh, as far as on the initial stakeholders? Yes. Oh, absolutely. There's, there's Were any of our uh, people involved? Not that I know of, no. no. We, um, we meet with them on a monthly basis, and there have been um, ongoing presentations and update after update and they've actually just updated it again about two months ago mm -hmm. So they definitely are taking feedback from folks. It's because they have nothing else to do <coughs> Thank you This is Cahill. I, I actually think the um, People asked questions that I was going to ask but did they ask, ask for any changes to Team requirements or anything for the IEP teams or it was just the form basically not process or anything like that um from, from your presentation, I think it sounds like it's pretty, it makes more sense than the older one. Um, do you feel that way? We yeah. feel that way. Yeah. Again, we just really go back to it's, it's new, it's updated, it's including a lot more information. The fact that, um, you know, first and foremost, it's taking, you know, student voice and family voice. Some of those things that were found later in the IEP mm -hmm. are now found earlier mm -hmm. and really like the transitional planning form, should really be driving the IEP goals and objectives for a student. And previously, that was at the end, and now it's before the goals and objectives. Um, looking at, is a student um, an EL student as well, and, and do they require both EL and special education services? Taking that into account when we're supporting them. Um, the autism considerations, that that's part of the conversation. The bullying state, I mean, all of these things we feel are really going to enhance what we already know that we're doing really well, but making it even better. Good, good. And um, I think that's great about the uh, IT transitioning, being yes. able to autofill yes. everything into yep. the other document. That's amazing yes. that he can do that. It doesn't all, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. obviously, <laughs> because things are I was going to say, you probably have to double places. check. Yeah. yeah. But, and, you know, as far as Aspen, one of the real tricky ones is the accommodations and modifications, because before it was just a list, and now we have to sort mm -hmm. them into the different categories. But the way it's working in Aspen is when you go into the new IEP, right there, there's a box of all the old accommodations, and it says in red, this will not print, but then you can see them right in front of you and cut and paste them into the right categories. So you're not like flipping back, back and, and forth, forth to try yeah. to find the current accommodations they have in place that are working. We can just cut and paste them right in Aspen into the correct categories. Good. So hopefully it'll help us not miss any as we're transferring over as well. That's excellent. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Gutcher. Um, 
Sorry, guys. I hit one wrong button. <laughs> Done. Hang on one second. Laura, <laughs> Dude, uh, we'll have to get the. Uh... Yeah, Ryan. I don't. I, I, I just hit your mic. Uh, here comes Ryan. That's all. Oh, oh, got it. Oh. Sorry. What do you think? <laughs> you got it. You got it. Yep. Uh, excellent Sorry, presentation as always. A um, couple of questions. So this is not just new students, new IEPs. This is all students. Yes. And it starts in 2020. 2024, 2025. And how many students do we currently have on an IEP? Um, at last check, it was about 2,000. 2,000. And you said you have one parent academy scheduled or multiple? Well, we, we're we doing one parent academy for just us, and then our CPAC is doing some additional stuff as well. Yeah. And then if need be, I would imagine probably next fall, We'll do another one because that's when it's actually going to become live and real for families. Got it. Um, so we we certainly anticipate that this is going to be a process for families as well. Um, one of the things that we did when we sent out the flyer for the Parent Academy is um, families are requesting blank copies of the IEP now so that they can follow along for the presentation as oh, well. Um, and similar, you know, they've been asking some questions, and we're happy to answer them as we go. Do uh, when, and when did the when do these 16 pages have to be completed by the family? Is it at the beginning of the year before you commit to school? Is it during the year? Is it? So this is the document that's completed um, at the IEP meeting. So it's once a year. And that meeting takes place? Annually. Say again? Annually at some point during the school year. So it all doesn't have to be done in September? No, no, okay. no, no. Over the course of the whole oh, So each year, year, a student with a, an IEP, they're met to either review or reevaluate uh, re or an initial mm -hmm. IEP, and that's when this document is uh, updated. Oh, so everybody has their own schedule. Yes. Everybody has a different so date. So we have yeah. students in September, October, November, like all throughout the year. Right? Got it. So you're not going to be overwhelmed on one no, specific no, date? No, no, Okay. Got it. I didn't know if there was any state requirement that it had to be done by The X only requirement yeah. is, is full implementation school year 24-25. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I imagine that you're going to have to get back in front of the parents over and over and over again, you know. Well, to, to parents that are, are used to the IEP, they, they understand the process. It's more just that the document is going to look different. Yeah, yeah a lot more to populate. I think a lot of it will happen, especially at the IEP meeting. Like, it just might be a little bit longer of what parents might be typical, just so that we can sit and make sure that the parents understand where all that documentation went, where it is in the form, where they can find it. Um, so that piece, I imagine, might be a little bit longer. But even though we're doing the parent academies, I think all of our case managers will really work through each of those pieces with the parent at the meeting so that they're really clear on where we can kind of shift to. I mean, it seems logical. It seems sequential. It mm -hmm. seems comprehensive. It, you know, mm -hmm. as a parent, it would be, to me, welcome that mm -hmm. the, the way it's free packaged. Jen has also created a really nice tips and tricks uh, to share with our staff and our families that in the old IEP, it was here, but in the new IEP, oh, it's here, great. so that we can, <laughs> it, it's been incredibly helpful, especially during our trainings when we're, you know, helping folks navigate. Yeah, and um, Dan Pacho and I were working together yesterday, and he was able to link that document right into Aspen, so when you're on the new IEP form, there's a little help button, and if you click on that button, it will take you to that um, kind of conversion chart that I created, um, and also a link right to the uh, the Jesse website to the IEP IEP improvement project page. Um, so the, as staff are in Aspen trying to write a new IEP, they have a couple of resources right there that they can click on. Excellent, thank you, Mrs. Lebo. Yeah, I'm sorry. I have one other question. Um, so I saw that the assessment page was for the state and district assessments, but. There's no place in here for students like psychological evals and all, all that other testing that gets done for to determine whether or not a student is a special needs student. So that's all going into the new present level of performance pages. So all the test results from their evaluation okay. will be written into those present level of performance. So which one of, the, which one of them? So it will be spread out between all four of them. So the psychological testing is an interesting one. I'm actually meeting with the psychologist next week to talk to them about it. So 
their cognitive testing portion will likely go on the first one, the academic page, whereas the more like social assessments they do will go on the second behavior social emotional page. The speech results will go on the communication one. The OTs will go on the additional one. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's... This is going to be a lot of work. It's yeah. a little more spread out, but when you actually read the title of each page, it makes more sense what information is on okay. that page. Instead yeah. of it, before it was all lumped together in one spot right. with individual paragraphs for each section. So now you can look at the title of the page and know what information should be there. So. Thank you. I just had a few questions also. Um, so it's not, it, the autism pop-up questions that you showed on there. So um, autism wasn't the only primary disability on that page. So if you were to click on one of those other ones, a neurological impairment or intellectual impairment, would those, would, do they have separate pop-up questions or is it just autism that has those? It's just autism. When, when students have a primary disability of autism, there are really specific criteria that we need to consider when we're developing their IEPs. Okay. And that's what those pop-ups help to populate. Gotcha. And for okay. students who don't have a diagnosis of autism, those questions don't show up. So again, to take that confusion out for families, so you're not looking at it and saying, why didn't we talk about this part? Because your student, you know, doesn't have those needs that need to right. be addressed. It doesn't apply. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm hearing that there's a lot of um, kind of resources for people on staff to kind of fill, the, fill in in the forms, which is great, because I think this is a huge amount of work. Um, so f first question on that is, do you feel like you have enough support to handle this transition? Because, you know, as Mr. Gutcher said, they're not all on one date, but it's kind of a lot throughout the year. So do you feel that there's enough support that this will be manageable? We do. We actually, um, we went to a full day training as well as Carrie Conley, and then we've been slowly Knowing this was going to be a lot, we've kept it to really small chunks for our staff, um, usually about an hour and a half to two hours. Um, and then also I was able to apply for a grant through DZ that would allow us, allow us um, additional fiscal resources if we did need to provide additional trainings um, for any of our staff that feel that they need more support. That's great. Um, and then my concern a little bit is more, um, so families, as you mentioned, I'm glad there's a parent academy, and I'm sure um, CPAC's going to also provide a lot of resources. But I'm wondering if um, at that parent academy, are you going to be taping that so that um, that's something you can kind of keep referring back to? So if families didn't get to see that, maybe even when you send out the IEP to a family before they come in for their meeting, oh, that's um, a good idea. you yeah. can link to that so that they can understand why it looks different and maybe just go through that process without having to, you know, re-explain it to every family that might call and say, why does this look different? I don't understand. Um, they could have that resource available to them. Sure, that's a great idea. Okay. Um, and I love the idea of a longer meeting um, kind of next year going into that, assuming families may have some, some questions about where something might go or how we can explain further um, on that. But otherwise, I think um, it looks like a lot of work, but it looks like it might be better in the long run. Um, and I'm very curious as to how those, uh, the asking of all the students about their goals, especially the younger students, how that's going to go. So We are too. <laughs> Excited to hear about that. Thank you. Thank you very Anyone much. Else? All right. Thank you all. Thank, Thank, you. All. Thank you. Our only agenda item, so I'm going to adjourn the special ed subcommittee meeting. Thank you. I'd like to call to order the Wednesday, March 13th, uh, meeting in the Quincy School Committee Policy Subcommittee. We have two items on the agenda of the school year, calendar survey results and the draft 2024-2025 school year calendar. Superintendent Mulvey. Thank you, and good evening, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. Uh, tonight we'll be sharing the results of the CPS school year calendar survey. Portuguese and Spanish. As were the email sent out sharing the survey link. Uh, the survey was open from February 14th to March 4th. Uh, I will be going uh, through the survey uh, results with you, highlighting um, key areas of data. Uh, there are uh, a lot of numbers, so I'll speak slowly um, so that uh, we can keep uh, track of all the information. Uh, before I begin, I do obviously want to thank uh, Laura Owens. 
for managing the survey data and for putting together all of the information that uh, we'll be reviewing tonight. So thank you, Laura. Uh, 1,249 parents responded. So I'll do the parents first, and then I'll do staff, and then I'll do student data, just so we can break it down that way. Uh, so 1,249 parents responded, representing 2,017 students currently enrolled in QPS, or just under 20% of the student population. We know this because parents were, were asked um, to select the grades that they have students enrolled in. Uh, the majority of parents, according to the data, do not want to begin the school year prior to Labor Day. That's 62% in the documents that are before you. Uh, and they don't want to collapse um, the February and April vacation weeks into a single week in March. That was 56%. Uh, for the questions on adding observed holidays, for Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Diwali, in Aid al fitr most respondents were neutral or did not agree with adding the additional days. For Lunar New Year, 43% of respondents agreed or strongly agreed. 26% were neutral and 31% disagreed or strongly agreed. Uh, for removing Good Friday, there was a similar split uh, of 41% agreed or strongly agreed. 21% were neutral, and 38% disagreed or strongly uh, disagreed with the removal of Good Friday. 42% uh, of parents responding agreed or strongly agreed that there should be no change to the calendar structure. 28% were neutral, and 30% disagreed or strongly disagreed. Those were the parents. Next is the staff. Uh, 695 staff members, 38.6% of our staff responded to the survey. Uh, more than 50% of the staff disagree or strongly disagree with starting the school year before Labor Day or adding observed holidays or Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Diwali, and Aid al fitr 81% disagree or strongly disagree with changing the February and April vacation weeks to a single week in March. For Lunar New Year, the response was similar to the parent response, with 42% agreed or strongly agreed to adding it. 21% were neutral and 37% disagreed or strongly disagreed with regard to adding Lunar New Year to the calendar. For removing Good Friday, 34% of staff respond, uh, responded, uh, agreed, or strongly agreed. 22% were neutral, and 44% disagreed or strongly disagreed. 53% uh, of staff responding agree or strongly agree there should be no change to the calendar structure. 22% were neutral, and 25% disagree or strongly disagree. Next is students. Um, there were uh, 317 of 3,836 students, that's less than 10%, in grades 8 through 12, including our LEAP students, responded to the survey, which was sent to their QPS email address. The majority of students, no surprise, responded that they agree or strongly agree with adding all observed holiday options, 88%. <laughs> <clears throat> That's pretty impressive. <laughs> if only we had a, a clear response on all of our surveys in that regard. Uh, the majority also disagree or strongly disagree with starting school year before Labor Day, removing Good Friday as an observed holiday, or changing to February and April vacation weeks to one week in March. The students were split over keeping the current calendar structure with 25% agreeing or strongly agreeing, 32% neutral, and 44% disagreeing or strongly disagreeing. So I know that's a lot of information summarized. Uh, the particular details are before you, broken down, as I said, by parent results, staff results, and student results. Uh, so that is the data that you requested. We'll start with the committee first, uh, Mrs. Cahill or Mrs. Lebo? Mrs. Um, uh, yeah, hang on one second. Question. Let me just, is that me? Yeah. You, got it. Please. I have a couple of questions. One, um, we had 1,249 parents that took the survey. Mm -hmm. Is that one parent per family, or is it both parents per family? Like, can any fa father, mother, guardian? There was nothing to put, yeah. 
there was nothing to preclude that. So, okay. multiple people. Because family. we could have 1,249 parents could be 600 families, you know, who, who participated in the survey, potentially. Um, my other question would be, if we were to change the calendar to add, let's say, Lunar New Year, it, what, what's the implication for um, contracts, QEA, and any kind of, you know, adding those additional days? <clears throat> Um, Is that something? Yeah. So uh, uh, with regard to, it wouldn't affect the QEA because obviously this committee um, establishes the school year calendar. Um, for 52-week employees, there would be a cost associated with that, with adding a, a holiday. Um, so I, I don't know. I, unfortunately, Mr. Mullaney isn't here tonight. But that We can get you the exact cost potentially of that would be uh, basically... Um, what would end up happening is very likely each collective bargaining unit would ask that that um, Lunar New Year be a paid holiday mm -hmm. if school is closed. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, so in collective bargaining would add potentially a, uh, an additional cost. Of course, if in fact Lunar New Year was added, we certainly would get a request to impact bargain on that okay. uh, so that they would, you know, so that the day off potentially for staff would be uh, paid. That would be for the 52 year staff and even potentially even the para staff as well. Okay, so that could add a cost to the, the, the budget. It it could, it yes, is. it would be. I know you were all familiar with the negotiation process, but it would be the cost of adding a, uh, a holiday to the calendar at one point that was uh, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 100,000, but I think it's much more than that per year. But I can get you the exact number from Mr. Mullaney. Okay, that's okay. I'm just curious, and also, um, the the contracts are based on 180 days school year, so it doesn't matter when it starts and when it ends. And there's nothing that it's in these contracts that have like an end date, you know, other than we can't go past the end of June. June 30th has to be the end of our. Regardless, if we have seven days of snow, eight days of snow, June 30th is the last date. Uh, that's that correct. We can be in school. Correct. Okay. With unless we file a waiver with the state or something like that. If we're not, if we're missing a lot of the days, um, and I think that for right now to, to hear what the rest of the discussion is and go from there. Emily, any question? Oh, you do. On the students, um, on the absences, it says that at. 30% of the Quincy High students identify as Asian. What percent of the North Quincy High School students identify as Asian? Oh, who's that? Oh. Go ahead. Laura, Sorry, say that again, Hold on one second. I'm just looking. looking we have the data. On the, on the Fifty-four point two percent of North Quincy High School students identify as Asian. What would you say? Fifty-four point two percent. And what what does that actually include? I, it's not just Chinese, Vietnamese, uh, and Indian, 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 Indian Pakistani, Korean. anyone anyone from the subcontinent as well. And they do not celebrate Lunar New Year to the best. Correct. Way. So not. We don't know what percentage of that fifty-four percent. I, yes, I have not. Uh, there's no way, actually, there's no way to de officially determine that. But it shows here that 10% of the students who identified as, who do not identify as Asian, also took the holiday off. Correct. Thank you. I'm good. What number are you now? The mayor? Yes. Mrs. Perdios. Thank you. Um, I just had a, so, and I wanted to just for clarification under the Lunar New Year absences um, from February 9th, I'm wondering if maybe we should kind of do a little quick recap of that for sure. people watching at home, but also um, my question would be to clarify, so 41% of North Quincy students took Lunar New Year off last year. Is that correct? This yes, this past yes, February, okay. yes. Um, okay, and if you wouldn't mind just yeah. doing a quick little summary of sure. that. Um, sure, so, uh, yeah, so February 9th, which was the day before L Lunar New Year began on Saturday the 10th, um, North Quincy High School had 620 students out of approximately 1,500 students absent, which is 41%. 
Uh, Quincy High School with a similar enrollment had 175 students absent, 30% uh, of their population I identify as Asian. Um, 39 students cited a cultural holiday as their, the reason for their absence. You know, there's a mix. People went on college visits, people are sick, you know, that the total that um, all other Quincy Public Schools, um, which is uh, 17 other buildings, Delicieza, Delicieza, all the elementary schools and all five middle schools had a total of 459 students absent, and that was about 6.6% 6, 6 of the district. Which is, and, and there, I also compared individual schools with the previous two Fridays, and for elementary and middle schools, it was basically the same. And, and do we have those numbers as well for any staff? I did not look at the staff, no. Thank you. Thanks. Other questions, comments? I just have a, a, a couple. So, uh, Laura, back to the, the breakdown of the high schools. Mm -hmm. is, the, is the, where it says 10% of absent students do not identify as agent, but cited cultural holiday as the reason for the absence. Is that just north, or is that both? That's just at north. That's just north. A handful of students at Quincy High School who do not identify as Asian cited a cultural holiday, but it was fewer than five. So what, what percentage of the absences were holiday related? Did you say so? If you if you if you cite a cultural holiday, yep. it's an excused absence. So. So, uh, other than those that were sick. The the rest of them said, basically, cultural holiday. Basically, yes. Yeah. And um, and the absences. There are thirty percent. What, what percentage of the students that were abs absent that day? cited cultural holiday as the reason. Do you know at Quincy? At North Quincy High School? At Quincy. At Quincy High School, so 39 out of 175. Cited the? Cited the cultural holiday, so a little more than 25%. Got it. Um, what, what's clear to me is that nobody wants to go to school before Labor Day, and, and nobody, nobody wants to lose uh, April and February vacation. That's crystal clear among everybody. Uh, I had a question about the contracts, but Mrs. Cahill asked that question as well. Um, Mr. Mulvey, mm -hmm. of, of the days that you mentioned that were in the survey, what days does the city of Quincy offer its employees as a day off? Um, so of the, the days that are on here, um, so Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. Rosh Hashanah, well, obviously, uh, Labor Day is offered by everybody. Yeah. But Rosh Hashanah, no. Yom Kippur, no. Diwali, no. Lunar New Year, no. Um, Eid El Fitr, no. Um, Good Friday, I don't believe, is uh, on the city side any longer. It used to be, but that was removed. Uh, so that's it. Yeah. I mean, what... What's interesting is, is much like the presidential election, the undecided voters here mm -hmm. <laughs> are, are the ones that, um, that are key. But in, in the case of the survey, they don't have to commit. So it leaves ambiguity in the absence of majority. So any, yes, Mrs. Hubley, hold on. Mrs. Hubley. Thank you. Um, of the 459 students, um, 17 other schools, do you know how many of them um, cited a uh, cultural holiday? I don't, but I could, I could get that information. Okay, and also if you could get us the, the breakdown, how many, from which schools? So oh, sure, yeah, I, ha that, I definitely have that. Yeah, okay. thank you. Any additional questions, comments? Okay. Uh, moving on, Superintendent Mulvey, uh, looks like we have a couple of options for the calendar before us. Yes, um, you have two options before you. Their uh, first option, the option A, is a calendar without adding any additional holidays. Uh, and the second option is a calendar showing the additional uh, addition of uh, Lunar New Year, which, was, which would be on January 29th. 
for this coming school year. Uh, discussion first with members of the committee. Hold on. So I'm going to, um, I am going to ask to push option A to um, the school committee regular meeting for a vote. Um, I just feel as long as the students have an observed or an, or an, um, an approved absence for that day, I think that um, works evidently for the students who took the day that they felt like they needed to observe their holiday. So that would be my motion would be to push that forward. I don't know if anyone else. Mrs. Lebo. Yeah, I agree with that. I would do the same thing. I would vote to uh, have option A be our option. I'm just based on the data. I think it really supports that. Um, the vast majority of people really don't want the calendar changed. Any discussion from members not on the committee? Mrs. Perdios. Thank you. Um, I'm going to support option B. Um, I think that our students, our families, have told us 15 ways to Sunday that they want Lunar New Year off, that, they, that it's important to them. It's a large percentage of our student population. Um, we did a survey. The majority of parents asked for it off. Majority of staff asked for it off. Plurality. Um, excuse me? Plurality, right? Plurality. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it wasn't over 50%, right? No. No, but I mean, so for, st for parents, it was 43% strongly agree or strongly agree with having Lunar New Year off. 31 strongly or very strongly or disagree or strongly disagree. So that's an over 10%. I, like I say, it's, it's difficult because we can't put all our eggs in the survey basket, but I think it's another piece of evidence that shows that our families, uh, this is important to them. And it impacts a lot of students. And there's certainly the absences, but the families that feel like they don't want to take that day off of school for cultural reasons or um, educational reasons or whatever. I think that we're not including them in that uh, factor. So um, I enjoy having Christmas off with my family, and I know that this is very important for a large percentage of our students and our families. So I support having ad adding Lunar New Year in. So I'm going to be supporting option B. Uh, this is Hubley. Thank you. Um, I'm also agreeing with Mrs. Cahill and Mrs. Lebo. I would support option A. Um, I don't see all that in the survey, what Mrs. Perio sees. Um, I don't see an overwhelming, and I agree with our 53% of our staff who don't want any changes. Um, and if also, like Mr. Gutro said, combining the, the neutral with that brings it up to 75% if we add the neutral with our strongly agree, then that's a lot of staff members that don't want to change. Um, one thing I would like to suggest as a change to this calendar option A, if we could, um, is to take off the part on the bottom that says, in case of five days of school cancellations, because up until an hour before this meeting, I was getting a phone call from somebody who was confused about that. Um, it is completely, that happens all the time. I know, but the state actually requires us to carry that. Really, we yes. have to put that on there, even though... The calendar gets, this is one of the pieces of data that Dan Pacho submits to the state, and it has to say that. Can is we this, I've been trying it? the whole time I've worked here to... I mean, we could publish a version. I guess we can publish a version. Yeah, I mean, if, even if it yeah. could say underneath that if there is cancellation due to weather, other emergencies, that these days will be need to be made up other, additionally. Yes. Or, yes. Because people are very confused about that. They I, don't I understand the, that we don't have five too. days made yes. into the calendar. It's yes. not there. And right. Maybe yes. that's the maybe that's the language. There are no built-in days to the mm -hmm. calendar. Maybe that's it. Okay. So sure. new, new parents are not understanding that, and it's very okay. we confusing. We can definitely say that every every weather-related closure must be made up. Something yeah. Something along yeah. those lines. Okay. That would be very helpful, yeah. I think, to a lot of parents. So if we could just change it somehow, that would be wonderful. But yes, sure. that's all I have to add. Thank you. Any member of the subcommittee have comments on that? No. On that issue? Any any objections? Any problems with that? No, no I, I okay. completely agree. I think this is confusing. 
And yeah, I know it has to be there, but I think it, we, they didn't tell us exactly it. what to say, did they? No, but we can reward it. Absolutely. Reward it. Yes. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Mrs. Perdios. Um, I agree with that as well. I think that is confusing, and if we can make that any clearer, I agree with that. Um, another change I was thinking that perhaps might be confusing to families, so um, on the to the left of that where it has major religious and cultural holidays, I'm glad that we list all of those, but I don't think that it's clear that those are not days off, um, especially for families who um, are new or mm -hmm. to, to QPS or that don't speak the language. Um, and I think maybe listing them might be confusing, so if there's a way, I know there's already a lot of words, but if there's a way to get on there that while these are not mm -hmm. observed, no school days, mm -hmm. they are also important days in the lives of our students, something like that. Um, and then just to um, make one last comment on the, um, the Lunar New Year discussion that, you know, I think families, from what I understand, that I had a lot of families reach out to me on the survey saying that they were, um, they answered neutral because they don't observe the holiday. So they didn't want to speak for families that may have celebrated that holiday. So a lot of families, that it just didn't impact them, but they were in support. I had people reach out to me and say they were in support of having those holidays off, but they just didn't feel like they should be answering for those families. So I think that somehow the format of the, the survey might have been a little confusing, even though we didn't mean for that to be. Um, so I, I still feel that um, we have had an overwhelming number of students come to us. We had parents come and speak at open forum on multiple occasions. Um, and, and, you know, I agree that there's something. So when we're looking at staff, there is 53% that asked for no change to the calendar, but there is 42% that, um, which is higher than that agree that we should be adding Lunar New Year, which that percentage is higher than the amount that strong, that disagree or strongly disagree. So. I think there is evidence to show that there is support for Lunar New Year, and um, I don't think it's a big ask um, for our, for this body to um, to give them that day. Thank you. So I have um, a, a process and, and language question for Mrs. Owens, if I could. So, Laura, the the um, I think to Mrs. Perdios's point on the first, where it says major religious and cultural hol holidays. The purpose of listing them is to say that they are eligible for excused absences, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it says that in so many words, but it doesn't say they're eligible for excused absences. Um, so uh, j just so I understand, so reworking the language on the bottom left, reworking the language on the bottom right mm -hmm. before. So does this need to... Um, the reworked version come before the subcommittee once again, or does it? Do we get it? That, that's up to you. Yeah. So what is your what is the timeline for voting on the school calendar? So if if we if you move one of the versions tonight with the caveat that this language will be adjusted, yeah, I would then present the adjusted language to the whole school committee on next week on March twentieth. Okay, and that is for discussion, and then that would be eligible for vote on April 10th. And, and when do we need to vote on the school calendar? Before when? Uh, we, before before we're, June? Well, yeah, I mean, yes. And traditionally, we do it in January. You know, we do it in yeah. January or, you know, it's finalized in February. So people are asking, yeah. um, and at least I can give them the basic outline, like they want to know when April vacation is next year. It's mm -hmm. all, you know, it is always the same week. Yeah. yeah um, we but if we, if we keep it in subcommittee. We have another subcommittee scheduled on March 27th, but that would push the approval to May, to the first, to May 1st, mm -hmm. for next year's calendar. So, yeah. Uh, Mrs. Lebo. I, I have one other concern about, you know, I, I understand what your, what your rationale was for putting excused absences in here, but I can see some high school kids taking every one of those days off as a cultural holiday. Yeah. Because we had 10% of the kids at North Quincy who already one day Asian who took the other. Yeah. And so, I, I mean, it's, it is, I, I don't know how we get the information out to people, but you could see, I could personally see a kid in my class taking every one of those holidays. Mm -hmm. Got it. And being excused. So I worry about adding that a little bit. Understood. And I would, I would like to make a motion that we move option A to the full school committee. I, I think uh, Mrs. Cahill had made that motion. So 
Um, second it then. Yeah, uh, Ms. K, a second, second in committee. So the way the way that it would work would be the committee of three would cast the vote tonight, mm -hmm. correct? And and then it would go to school committee. And then at the next school committee meeting, is it an agenda item or is it reports committees? It's an agenda item under old business. Old business. Open. Yeah. For a vote. Yeah. Well, I I raise yeah. this because I I, I know and then vote the next. Yeah. I know it fairly, you know. For, a fair amount of certainty that I will be tardy to that meeting because of a professional commitment, which means I probably won't get here till seven or seven thirty. So that could you could you could request to the chair that the agenda be taken out of order and old business happen Subsequ later in the later, later in, in the, the meeting. In the meeting, yeah, okay, and and okay, well, so I'll talk to the chair. If, if so, the it's, it sounds like it's the desire of majority of the committee a to cast the vote for a. Uh, tonight, as is with, with changes that we would see at the next meeting, assuming that we have it, then we can have a discussion around the whole school committee meeting about whether or not to move forward with it. Is that what I'm hearing? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we need a roll, need yeah, a roll, roll call, call of the subcommittee. Yeah. The, it, can I just say one other thing? Uh, because I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to join my colleagues in casting a vote to move it forward for sub subsequent discussion and, and a vote. But I think it was a months ago or a year ago where we had this discussion and we had a lot of folks in to talk about it. It, it, it peeves me <clears throat> that we will say to a student, you can be home for a holiday, but their parent works in the planning department <clears throat> or, or some other department of the city of Quincy and we say, you know what, you have to take a vacation day in order to be home with your child. So to me, it's do we as a city support that as a holiday? And if so, of course, the, the school committee is going to abide by whatever the city chooses to do. But right now, a vacation day on the city side is an excused absence. And right now, the policy that we've had in place is it, it is an excused absence, a, a cultural observation. So. That, that, that inequity really bothers me, that, that the, the city should, should look at that issue and, and deal with it more holistically. That's the, I, and I said that last time, and, and I feel very strongly about that now. Um, so uh, Mrs. Perdios. Just to your point on that, um, if, if that's going to be our standard, then um, according to Mr. Mulvey, um, the city does not have Good Friday off. They have taken that off their books. So should we then remove Good Friday from our calendar to align as well? I mean, that. so if there's an inequity there, we already have an inequity like that. So um, just putting that information out so there. Can, Mr. Mulvey, can you explain how that's addressed in the contract and what would need to happen? Um, what hap I believe what happened on the city side is Good Friday was removed, but all of the employees received an additional personal day, is my understanding. Um, so that, I believe that's what happened on the city side. On our side, on the school side, I, every contract has, um, Good Friday in it. Uh, so if we were to remove it, we would have to begin impact bargaining with every union in the, in, on the school side. And, um, so, uh, obviously if we're going to attempt to remove it, I'm assuming the Union may object to that, or they may be looking for some other compensation for the day. Right. Understood. Okay. There's a, a motion and a second. Mr. Mulvey, if you would call the roll. Mr. Gatro. Yes. Mrs. Cahill. Yes. Mrs. Lebo. Yes. Motion passes. Motion passes. This will move to uh, the school committee meeting. We'll, we'll have a subsequent discussion on that. And so, and so, just one process question, Laura. Mm -hmm. So it comes before the school committee. We all collectively will have the opportunity to talk about it one more time. Is a vote then cast at the school? April tenth. Oh, so yes. One further discussion. We can, and so we could have the discussion at the next meeting, or we could have the discussion April tenth. Is that what we can you have the discussion at, on, at March twentieth? We could. You, could we have it at both? Or either? Uh, yes, you can have. You can discuss. You don't have to vote on April tenth. April tenth is the first opportunity to vote. Okay, so so if it comes before the board, 
at the next meeting, mm -hmm. wh what, if any, action does the board have to take? So you can discuss and you can uh, you could approve the, the changes you asked me to make to language. You could ask for further changes there. Got it. Or you could say we are all, you know, you're all set and it's ready to vote on at the next meeting. Very good. All right. Uh, no further business being before the policy subcommittee. We stand adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.